You're both. I'm going to start recording two of my Manso politics students. One, Carolyn from um, from Montreal is on, and Jillian from Massachusetts, and they took a course that I teach online called Hollywood and Disclosure. So they're going to have questions for you, Paul, at the end, and. I'd like to introduce Paul Davids. We've been friends for over 20 years, I think, Paul. And we always find ourselves in the weirdest places, but we've gone to conferences together and we've also we've also been able to uh, meet in Roswell. And people ought to know you've written so much. If I had to go through everything, you were the producer of the actual movie Roswell with Kyle Laughlin and and Martin Sheen, and that was years ago. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then Paul, hey. he used to live in Hollywood. He used to live in Los Angeles. Now he's coming to us from Sedona, Arizona. He's done several films. We can talk about all of those. We can talk about the books you've written and the latest book you've written, which is called Growing Up Sci-Fi, which is like an album that you have. Uh, of all of how your parents came uh, from Hungary, or was the grandparents came from Hungary? Grandparents, grandparents. And your father taught mm -hmm. Georgetown University. He taught Jackie Kennedy. He taught her in the writing class. So and Bill Clinton. He taught Bill Clinton also. <laughs> Bill Clinton was one of his students. Yeah. Oh wow! So as a senior. As, as a senior. So the thing is. I really, really, Paul and I are just good friends. So he asked me, uh, he, he said, what is this going to be? We're just going to gap. But before I finish all of the things that you did, your later works deal with near-death experiences in the Life After Death Project, correct? More than the, the near-death experience, the three films I did, uh, the Life After Death Project, the main emphasis is on spirit communication. It's on messages uh, that can be confirmed, received from those we're close to who have passed. And what is what is the evidence for it? Is there real evidence? Should we believe it? Who are the scientists that have studied it? And what's happened in my own life that makes me absolutely convinced? So that's been another uh, phase of my emphasis. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. There is no beginning. The reason I don't think any normal person gets involved in ufology. Uh, so you were in uh, Los Angeles. Explain to us about the sighting you had and how that worked. I will. Matter of fact, I, I pulled out a few items here. And this is the cover of International UFO Reporter uh, that, is, that is showing the sighting I had with my two children. Children. It was February 25th, 1987, uh, from our house in Highland Park, Los Angeles. My daughter, who was then nine, saw the craft first, and she screamed at me from the second floor, uh, Daddy, get upstairs right now. I see a flying saucer. And uh, I was skeptical. I, I didn't have any reason to believe that she was really seeing something important. And I said, uh, you know, is it, is it a Goodyear blimp? You, you know what a Goodyear blimp looks like. I'm working. I'm working. I was on the ground floor. But she kept screaming at me. Uh, and I ran upstairs and she pointed out her window. My six-year-old son came in at the same time. <clears throat> we practically collided in her doorway. And what I saw was a classic dome disc in broad daylight descending from a puffy cloud above uh, coming toward us. And we opened her window. We went out on the roof and we watched this flying saucer out on the roof for several minutes as it made silent maneuvers and really approached our house. It, it came to the point where it was either over the road in front of our house or over our neighbor across the street's uh, roof. And we're up on a hill. And after uh, after seeing it, some of the moves were sort of classic, you know, the, the wobble that's been described since 1947 when a flying saucer is remaining still hovering. Uh, and then it flew down over the valley. 
that we looked down on. And as it approached a three-story uh, building that used to be a schoolhouse and now was tenement housing, it vanished. It disappeared. It wasn't like it flew off <clears throat> at an incredible speed or it just, it, was, it wasn't there anymore. You couldn't see it. That was my first introduction to this field. And it's the reason that I became so completely immersed in it. I mean, from that day on, I began reading uh, many, many books, uh, I, you know, over a hundred within a year. I consulted with um, scientific specialists, people at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I had an opportunity to discuss it with director Robert Wise, who directed the famous film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. And this began to open up the door that uh, seven years later led to the production of uh, Roswell from Showtime. It took seven years, but that was, it was within a month or two of the sighting that I found out about Roswell for the first time. It was not well known at all. Um, there was only one major book on the subject, which I had not read at that time, The Roswell Incident, Bill Moore. Um, but uh, it was uh, Robert Wise. He not only directed The Day There Should Still, he also directed The Sound of Music and West Side Story and a few little films like that. Uh, he, he referred me... Um, you know, this is uh, this is the senior moment coming in where I'm I'm grappling for a name. Um, he referred me to the star of the Invaders, and from that actor who came to the house, who was very interested in UFOs and who wrote a report about it for the Center for UFO Studies, uh, he referred me. Uh, he he referred me to uh, the. Director of Special Investigations for the Center for UFO Studies, Donald Schmidt, who came to my house and wrote up a report and told me that he and Kevin Randall, an author and uh, someone who had who was still in the military, was Air Force Intelligence. He was in the reserve at that point. Uh, had served in Vietnam, but he was very interested in the Roswell incident also. They were reinvestigating it and they were writing a book that would, when it came out, it was called um, um, UFO Crash at Roswell. Uh, there were other books of Roswell that uh, Don Schmidt worked on later that uh, that were absolutely terrific. One called Witness to Roswell. But uh, this opened the door for me to get involved in uh, that investigation. And uh, I optioned the rights to their book that wasn't written yet. They had a 17 page outline. And for uh, we made an agreement um, that I would hold on to the rights, uh, uh, that I would show it to studios, because at that time, I had been working for Marvel Productions. I was on the Transformers show, the uh, episodic cartoons. I was the production coordinator. My name is on 79 episodes as in the production capacity. I also wrote some of those scripts. I wrote for other animated shows. Uh, so I knew a lot of people in Hollywood. My, my wife at that time was, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember, 87, uh, whether she was at Universal yet. She, she, she was at Universal as a senior vice president of special projects for around 25 years. But she was also before that TriStar Pictures as a, a senior VP and Columbia Pictures as a vice president. So we had many, many, many contacts in the industry. And I began pitching Roswell as a movie and getting turned down everywhere. I mean, I went to every network. I went to all the studios. I went to production houses. And everyone had a reason why they didn't want to make the movie. It was completely demoralizing because I felt at that time that I was on a quest, that I had an assignment. I mean, fate had dropped this in my lap. I knew, I knew that the flying saucers were real. There was no doubt in my mind about what I saw and that it was some craft that didn't relate to uh, any 
craft in my experience. You know, we all know airplanes and helicopters and dirigibles and we 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 know it all, but this no, this was a classic saucer. The way they were described um, in um, the report on unidentified flying objects by you can tell me the name, Paula Lieutenant, who wrote the first book. You, you mean Fiona? your your uh, no the report on unidentified flying objects came out in the early nineteen fifties. Um, oh, you mean he was with Project Project Blue Book. Oh, Project Blue Book. Okay. He he was with Project Blue Book. Well, Name is escaping me. Yeah, Heineck was with Project Blue Book. Heineck was the one who would come. No, up but with this him. was before. Um, I, it'll it'll come to me. In any event, I got deeply immersed in the Roswell incident. Was turned down all these places, and finally. I was at a reunion for the American Film Institute Center for Advanced Film Studies, where I had been a fellowship student. And I met up with director Jeremy Kagan, who I'd gone to school with at the AFI. We also went to school with David Lynch there and Terrence Malick and uh, Matthew Robbins and many people who went on to have major careers in the business. Caleb Deschanel was with us at that time. He, was, he became one of the most important cinematographers in Hollywood. Uh, Jeremy Kagan had directed a number of films and some TV movies, and he had strong contacts at HBO. And he got very interested in the story of Roswell. I had written a first draft script, and he uh, presented it to HBO. <clears throat> and HBO, excuse me, <clears throat> HBO made a contract with us to develop it. They uh, brought in Arthur Copet as the screenwriter, and Jeremy and I had the story credit for developing it. And uh, they developed it there, uh, seven drafts of screenplay, couple of years. And when we thought we were all ready to go in production, they, they killed the project. And they said, uh, we're not gonna make it, you can have it back. I was demoralized. One of the producers uh, connected with HBO, Eileen Kahn, Eileen Kahn Power, she had strong contacts at Showtime. She took the project over to Showtime and to our great, great good fortune, Showtime gave us contracts. They said yes, and they actually put us into uh, production. Uh, it was in 1993, we filmed it. It came out in 1994, nominated for Golden Globe as Best a television movie that year. And uh, that movie seen by millions of people, that I would say, along with the X-Files, those were the television entree for the public to know what the Roswell incident was, that the world had been deceived by a government cover-up, and uh, that this was uh, something that had been buried and people started to want it exposed. So that that's the background of how I became immersed. Okay, well, I have two questions for you. Number one, since I taught this course, uh, Robert Wise, I found out he was really interested. Did he ever have any conversations with you about UFOs? Yes, and, and he, he, believed, he believed they were real. Uh, and he came to that certainty while he was making The Day the Earth Stood Still when some high-level people from Washington came in, were on the set, and told him that he had no idea how close to reality his movie was. And, uh, you know, from that point on, he had, he had suspected it, but... Uh, he was informed, you know, it was real, but he did not understand why it was being covered up. It went so against the grain for him. Um, he said it didn't make intuitive sense to him. In his movie, uh, The Saucer Lands in Public Display and Everybody Knows, but uh, <clears throat> I think at that point, he wasn't thinking through all of the reasons that they've they've had for not disclosing. Um, but nevertheless, that uh, 
that was my experience with Robert Wise. Yeah, because that's that story goes very close to the Val Thor case uh, that that we that I've been looking at. Um, As a human-like alien, yes, human present here, alien, interacting with, with people, interacting with the people, telling them at the very end that they weren't ready to go, come into outer space by the way they were acting, and of course we shoot at them. We shoot them. And now, oh, Paula, Paula, I just thought of uh, the name Roy Thinnis was the actor who yeah. was in The Invaders. Right. And it, it was Robert Wise introduced me to Roy Thinnis, who came to my house, and he introduced me to the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. Yeah, Roy Thinnis actually appeared in Roswell a couple of times. I think I met him. At the he came to Roswell, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, going back to the movie, you got some high-level uh, actors. You got Martin Sheen and Kyle Laughlin, McLaughlin, Kyle McLaughlin, McLaughlin and McLaughlin. Dwight Yoakam, the country singer. Yeah, the country, country western count. Uh, he was country western singer. There, yeah. there was also Charles Martin Smith, who uh, was a major character actor. Xander Berkeley, who has become a really major actor since then. Bob Gunton, um, Bob Gunton, who has been in so many uh, movies uh, since then, major films. Uh, we we had a terrific cast, and it was because we had tremendous support and help from Showtime that believed in the movie, and they positioned it as what they called a tentpole picture. That would be a, one of their prominent efforts as a TV movie that would be a major summer release for them. That's what happened. Where can we see it now, though? You know conversation because I know my students that are watching right now would love to see it again and work other than buying it on Amazon I think you could buy it on Amazon where can you see it um yeah let me tell you uh this this DVD of it, it is still out there um this is not the first the original release DVD uh but this is the one that can still be purchased uh, but I must say that the rights that went from one organization to another, I mean, it started with Showtime controlled by Viacom <clears throat> and then Viacom, um, all of their product was split up between Paramount, that would be the feature films and CBS, which would be the television movies. And that included us. So the rights went to CBS now, I don't want to accuse anybody, but I will just say, I think CBS essentially buried the movie. They were not helpful for many, many years. It could have continued to have been exploited. And uh, until the DVD was eventually re-released, uh, you couldn't see it except for a pirated version online. Even right now online, CBS does not have it out there for streaming that would be profitable to them. Uh, there are bootlegged copies online. I will say this, if you go to my website, you go to my website, my, which is my art website, but it, it has uh, in the menu uh, films streaming online and you go down the list. I've done about 12 movies. And you'll see Roswell, and there's a link to it. You can click on, and you can see it. That will, you can see it that way. That's the easiest way to see it. The most, uh, uh, the fastest. My website, uh, Paula, is Paul Davids, and that's not Davis, but it's Davids D S, and then a hyphen, and then the word artist. Uh, dot com. Yeah, Paul, I've got a question here. There, there was an old technique of trying to hide something uh, that you don't want to be out there politically by buying the rights and then burying yeah. it. And I'm wondering if that's what you think happened in this one. It's an expression called catch and kill. Yes. And I think it's been done a number of times with important UFO uh, projects. I can uh, I can think of one in, in particular. Uh, but in this case, I don't think CBS set out you know, to, 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 to get it, to kill it. It's just, it was the coincidence that they were becoming the owners of all of these Viacom films by contract. 
So it was one of many they acquired. I wrote to them. I tried to talk to their lawyers at that time to get them to pay attention to it too. Because the original DVD, first it was released on video before there was DVD. Then comes the DVD. There was a 10 year contract, a 10 year period where the DVD was being sold at the Roswell Museum. It was very accessible, but when the contract ended, no one renewed it. And I could not get CBS to renew it. I think another, I don't know, 15 years went by. Uh, and then finally, uh, this showed up to my surprise. I discovered it by accident. Uh, yes, finally, they had re-released the DVD, but they had not put it out there for streaming. So yeah. that look, that's my experience with, uh, it was a major television production and it was my first UFO related project, but I had a passion for this. And I not only became a lecturer on the circuit, the MUFON International Symposium, um, the International UFO Congress. I spoke at many of these, but I also put out two videos, which you won't find. I'll just mention them to you. This was this would have been around 1995, 96. One of them was called Down in Roswell, where I compiled all of the uh, news clipping, the news reports, um, the little bits that had been on, on documentaries about Roswell and put them all into one VHS. The next one, oh, then there was a part two, which was a lecture I gave uh, on, on, on this, which was the reply to the Air Force report because the Air Force came out with their Project Mogul bunk uh, to explain it away. I think that was during... I think that the first report was in 1994, uh, about six weeks after our film came out. So I did a video reply to that. And then <clears throat> to my surprise, I was invited by the White Sands Missile Range Pioneers, which is the organization of the founders of America's rocketry program to um, down in White Sands to be the speaker for their 50th anniversary banquet. They wanted me to, as the producer of Roswell, to talk about that and and and, and UFOs in general. And uh, that was recorded. It became a video, never a DVD, but a video, <laughs> which was called um, Golden Anniversary Briefing for the White Sands Missile Range Pioneers. So I was immersed in it, you know, completely, um, and we're talking about the 1990s, writing articles for UFO Magazine. And then I went on and began making uh, one film after another, after another, after another. And I didn't get back specifically to UFO uh, for about a decade. Okay, I have a couple of questions about Roswell in general. And I hope everybody that's here watches that because it, it struck me a couple of things. First of all, did you ever personally talk to Jesse Marcel? Not Jesse oh, Jr., the Jr. kid, uh, but the father. Jesse Marcel Jr., oh, of course. I got to know Jesse Marcel Jr. very well. We brought him down to Roswell to participate in our bonus features and do interviews. I was in touch with him through the years. As a matter of fact, his daughter, Denise Marcel, we gave her a tiny little role in the movie. She plays a waitress <clears throat> in a restaurant where um, the mortician is talking to the nurse about the alien autopsy. And so that's Jesse Marcel's daughter. But, yeah, but Jesse was very helpful to disclosure through the years and wrote a book called The Roswell Legacy. Yeah, but his father, did you ever talk to, that's the nine-year-old kid, Jesse Marcel Jr., but I mean, he's a well. Well, no, I mean, he was he was when I, when we were making the movie, he was a, a, an adult uh, emergency uh, medical doctor, a general practitioner. Uh, he was nine years old when this happened in 1947. But uh, it was the adult Jesse Marcel Jr. His father was deceased by the time I became involved. Okay, that was number one question. Number two, the the story is very emotional because. Jesse Marcel, uh, played by Martin Sheen, goes back to a reunion. He goes back to a reunion in the movie. 
No, no, not Martin Sheen. It's Kyle MacLachlan. Oh, Kyle MacLachlan. That plays Jesse Marcel. Yes. He goes back to the movie. He goes back to a reunion and tries to get the truth, which is a, a beautiful way of introducing the story because he talks to all the people uh, in the at the reunion, like, I'm not crazy. I know this is real. You, you wrote that part, uh, which is very powerful in that movie. Um, and that's how the story unveils because he talks to way back when you knew this was real kind of thing. And the other question, Paul, is the very end, the alien. I don't, he, I saw the, the actual st statue of the alien you put in there, which is a, a very- Hey, Paula, let me interrupt. Let, let me interrupt. Yeah. Because I have, you call it a statue. It's the prop. It was the living alien in the movie. It's it's actually right opposite me in the chair I'm sitting in. And I'm going to turn my, my uh, uh, let's see. Oh, that's so cool. Now turn it around so we can see it. Can you see it? it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you seeing it? Yeah, talk. You have to talk so we can see it. So, uh, well, that was the, hold on, something just happened. Let me get this off. Uh, that was an audio animatronic construction um, by the company XFX. Steve Johnson was the head of the company, and they designed it based upon uh, the descriptions we were able to provide them of the Roswell alien. And so I ended up with this, and it's here in my in your home office. office. But tell me about yeah. the last scene, because that's so emotional. It brings tears to your eyes, because... He's in a hospital bed. The being is in the hospital bed. It is saying to Forrest Gall, there's more of us that are going to come, right? Yeah. More of us are coming. Uh, Forrest Gall hears this telepathically. More of us are coming. Yeah. And, and that's a powerful way of how the film ends. And it's pretty historical because Forrest Gall jumped out of the wind of a window in a hospital. I mean, he commit. They say he committed suicide, but Forrest Gall was very, very involved in this research. That's true. Um, what happened on my screen? It just something black just came up, or did somebody depart? Somebody depart. Uh, somebody came on, I think. But um, okay, you, you can see me. So yeah. Forrest Gall. He was the Secretary of War. They didn't call it Secretary of Defense yet back then. And uh, so that story has been very, very buried. The speculation is, of course, that he would have known about the Roswell uh, incident. And the speculation is that he was opposed to the secrecy. And they said he had a nervous breakdown. They said he jumped out oh a window. God. I, I couldn't hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, Paul. Now, hang on one minute because I have to bring you on. Everybody needs to mute their microphone. Otherwise, uh, we hear you talking. So, okay, hang on. Okay, go ahead, Paul. We have, oh, go ahead. Paul, you have to unmute, it, unmute your mic because your mic is... It should be unmuted now. Is it okay? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and talk about, finish talking about Forrest Gump. All right. So he was Secretary of War. Um, they said he had a nervous breakdown. He was hospitalized at Bethesda Naval Medical Hospital. I grew up near there, by the way. That's where they took John F. Kennedy's body after the assassination. They said that Forrestal uh, jumped. They had him in the highest uh, on the highest floor with a, an open window, an unlocked window, and they said he jumped. Of course, there's a lot of ufologists who speculate that he was killed, that he was pushed. Um, but we we incorporated that into the movie Roswell because it's a part of the story. But the real ending of our movie was not with the living alien. The, the, the ending really struck to the heart of the problem of disclosure. Because the character that Martin Sheen plays in the movie, we call him Townsend, is you sort of conclude that he's a disinformation agent who's providing some of the truth, but mixing it with things that you don't know whether they're true or not. And he challenges Jesse Marcel. Jesse, if you wanna go forward and go public, 
Go do it. Call up the New York Times. Do whatever you want. Who's going to believe you? What do you have? What is your evidence? What is your proof? Go do it. That was a taunt. And of course, uh, it's been the problem that the the evidence has been buried. The physical evidence is not available to the public. I've heard directly from at least one Roswell guard who was there who saw the aliens at that time. Um, it was, they were all commanded not to speak, not to discuss it, even with their family. Yeah. And so it was buried for around 30 years until Jesse Marcel Sr. decided to come forward. Do you realize that that year of um, Roswell, 1947, the same year the CIA was formed? Yes. The, the NSA was formed and Majestic 12 was formed. So there was a lot going on. And uh, those are the connecting the dots that uh, I've learned from Paula. Yeah, it's uh, all in now... the aftermath of the Roswell incident. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly when NSA was formed, but I know the CIA was formed that, that year. I think yeah. it's the same year. Yeah, it was okay. after the incident. So, uh, Paul, what do you feel um, that, you, uh, what do you feel, wait a minute, yeah, uh, yeah okay. Uh, when people, can we wait for questions till the end? Because Paul, you have to unmute yourself now. Okay, it should be unmuted now again. Um, uh, can you tell us how you feel about what's happening with disclosure in the UFO community right now? Right. Well, mixed feelings, but uh, in general, encouraged. Now, of course, the Pentagon has been as uncooperative as ever. It's the same story that it's been now for three quarters of a century at least. Uh, they won't give us anything. Um, they cloud the history. They obscure it. Their own reports exonerating themselves. We've never covered anything up. Sure. They just put out another of those reports recently that someone wrote a tremendous rebuttal uh, to. The most encouraging uh, things have been, first of all, the New York Times story and uh, was it 19 was it 1919 um, about the tic Tacs? Um, I think there was the mainstream press began to disclose that officially, there are craft that no one can explain. So they finally admitted that, which was, that was a major, major admission because if you look at how witnesses have been treated through the years, they've been debunked. They've been uh, silenced. They've been made to seem mentally unstable or been made out as if they were hoaxers and liars. And now finally, we reach a point in our history uh, about five or seven years ago where the government admits there are physical craft performing maneuvers that we can't explain and we uh, don't have the technology in our own craft to duplicate it. So that came a major, major step forward. They just wouldn't say what they are. They keep alive the speculation. Could it be Chinese? Could it be Russian? Could it be some natural phenomenon that we are unaware of? They they will avoid the word alien, you know, like a plague. So that that's the one aspect. But the other most important thing was the testimony of whistleblower um, Grush. What is Grush's first name? Do you remember? David. David Grush. David Grush. David Grush. Uh, his testimony before Congress was uh, absolutely explosive, uh, along with two pilots. That That is the most important hearing that's ever been held on UFOs. And uh, he, uh, he said that he could provide a roadmap to all of the special access projects the projects that have actually have biological remains and have uh, craft or the remains of crashed craft. Um, and he confirmed that in his knowledge, all this is true. And why should we believe him? 
because he was one of the most highly placed uh, intelligence officers who had the job of providing the briefing for the president uh, every day for condensing the uh, condensing the uh, the secret memos and dis the information that the uh, president needed to know. And he was the one that uh, formulated that and put it in a presentation for the president. This is a man who absolutely can be believed. Now, since he testified, the pushback has been horrific, just horrific. They've tried to discredit him, but absolutely not credible anything that they've thrown at him. They've tried to silence him from providing further information to Congress. Uh, but the congressional committee that questioned him is still very, very active. And people like Congressman Ted Burchett and uh, his colleagues, uh, they're, they're not done with this. They're, they're, they're beginning with this. And we'll see how far they get, whether anything is ever uh, really officially disclosed beyond what we already know. Well, you know, the, I, the, the, the frustration for me and for you is you talk to Jesse Marcel Jr. You've talked to the people in Roswell. You know it's real. It's like a game. Yeah. You know it's real. I talked yeah. to Corso. I talked to Clifford Stone. Yeah. Been, uh, Clifford Stone, Colonel Corso. Uh, the we've, had, we've had official lies for our entire lifetime. And... Um, as Linda Moulton Howe said to me recently, they have classified the truth. They've classified reality. And that's it. Well, we're not entitled, we're not entitled to know anything beyond what they've already let slip. Yeah, but but that that's frustrating for us. I don't depend on the government for disclosure, so I don't have that problem. <laughs> I know disclosure yeah. happened because I spoke to the people. You, you know disclosure happened because you spoke to Jesse Marcel Jr. and Walter Hott and Glenn Dennis, who was the mortician, and all the people that were there. So we know it's real. So it's like uh, the dog wagged the tail or wagged the dog or whatever it is. It's crazy. We're living in a crazy world. I I want to, the, to ask you a last question, and then all the people that are here, raise your hand to ask Paul a question. Paul has done more than Roswell as a movie. He did Jesus in India, Marilyn Monroe Unclassified, which is the death of Marilyn Monroe because she knew about UFOs. You've done Starry, Starry Night about Vincent Van Gogh, the, uh, the project of um, the... Uh, well, I did, I'll, I'll tell you a few of the others. I did <clears throat> Timothy Leary's Dead, right? which was the biography of the the promoter of LSD in the 1960s. And then uh, three films of, this is the this is the DVD of the Life After Death Project. In this DVD is film number one and film number two. Film number two is the Life After Death Project, two personal encounters. And it's a wonderfully successful film i you know i can't explain it. It, it i have to say that today uh, it is getting more attention and is probably the most successful of all my films people are watching this because i've taken people from all walks of life to have them convey their experience of feeling that they've had communication and proof of the survival of the spirit of people that they knew or loved friends relatives uh, who have in some way communicated with them after death. And the people I've chosen for this include doctors and nurses, uh, archaeologists, librarians, um, emergency room people, uh, just all different kinds of professions. I've got around 20 people talking about this. And uh, it follows up on the experiences that uh, that, that I had that caused me to first get involved in this subject matter. This is a caricature of Forrest J. Ackerman. He's also on the cover of this. He's, he's largely in my book, which you showed them earlier called Growing Up Sci-Fi in Garrett Park. He invented the term sci-fi. He was a futurist. He was an editor 
Here's and he problem. was the yes, he, he was the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, very popular movie magazine. He was in it for, uh, for about 200 issues. I got to know him when I was a young teenager. I won one of the movie contests in the magazine when I was a young teenager really helped give me the encouragement to go on and decide I could actually be a producer. But uh, Fari Ackerman died at age 92. He died uh, in December of 2008. And he was an atheist. Uh, I've written a book about this too, which I recommend to you. I'll show you. You can find this on Kindle along with some of my other books. It's called An Atheist in Heaven. This is again is Fari Ackerman. Uh, Fari was the atheist. He was a non-believer. He didn't believe in UFOs. He didn't believe in paranormal. Uh, he didn't believe in life after death. Uh, anything slightly uh, like that, he, he, he didn't believe it was real. And yet he was the editor of a magazine about all the movies that promoted all these things as fiction. For him, it was wonderful science fiction. He invented the term sci-fi. He loved science fiction. He devoted his life to it, <clears throat> but you couldn't convince him. Um, and I have to tell you a story about him and uh, science fiction author Ray Bradbury and Roswell, the UFOs, because Ray Bradbury didn't believe the UFOs were real either and confronted me about it. Um, but Fari Ackerman, uh, the atheist, said, Paul, uh, I don't think there's anything afterwards. I think it's like, you know, the, it's like unplugging a computer, you know, that, the, that's it. He said, but if it turns out I'm wrong and there's some big sci-fi convention in the sky and I'm reunited with all the people I admired in the field. And he said, when that party dies down, I'll try to drop you a line, but don't count on it. <laughs> he said with a wink. Well, my life changed after he died because a couple months after he died, we held a huge memorial for him at the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood. Every seat was filled. It was like 600 people. I was one of the speakers there. Ray Bradbury was a speaker there. John Landis, uh, so many people uh, who knew him and admired him because he was, he was much loved in the field, spoke at his memorial. But that weekend... It started with two producers from Canada who had made a movie about him uh, called, I think, uh, Forrest J. Ackerman, Famous Monster. They went to his crypt. They rapped on it. Hello, Fari, we're here. We're here for your memorial. We're going to show our movie to everybody. Uh, we miss you. And within an hour, they heard from him on their computer. It, it was absolutely bizarre. They told me the story. They both swore to it that one of them, when blogging, when trying to post a blog um, on a site that gives you a CAPTCHA code to know that you're a human and not a robot, the CAPTCHA code came up, it was his name, Ackerman000 comes up when they're trying to post this. It absolutely blew their minds. And then one of them said to the other, I mean, is he still here? You know, I mean... Do, I mean, is he really dead? And on there were two computers in the room, and on one of the computers where the screen was, um, the, the screen was down, they suddenly heard a voice of a little emoticon character in response to, is he really dead? This little voice spoke out and it said, oh my gosh, no way. They heard this. And they searched the internet and they found the little emoticon of the little smiley guy who says, oh my gosh, no way. But they weren't hooked up to that on the internet at that time. It wasn't on their hard drive. How in the world does this thing suddenly talk to them? So they had this experience. They told it to me. And within a week, I'm in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we have a vacation home. My wife didn't go with me on that trip. I was alone. And Fari had said he would drop me a line if he could, right? Well, here's what happened. And if you see the Life After Death Project, number one, the whole story is, is there. Because I printed out 
a 24 page document of business meetings and business phone calls for tax purposes and intended to go over it that night. I left the house. I went to a casino for an hour or two. When I come back after losing a little bit, <laughs> uh, I take this 24 page document and of course the ink is dry. It, it, it was printed a couple hours previously. I stapled it. I toss it down on my bed and I intended to soon climb into bed and start going through it and take notes. I went out of the room. I think I was in the bathroom for a, a while. And when I came out and looked at the, do at the, at the document, I want to tell you that 60 seconds changed my life as much as seeing the saucer uh, in 1987 because the shock was a line had been dropped onto my document. There were four words there now blacked out very neatly, targeted, surgically blacked out. You could still kind of read the first two words, but the second two words completely opaqued. And it was still moist, whatever had been used to cause this. And I was alone in the house. There was no one there physically who could have done it. It blew my mind. But I didn't connect it with Fari for actually it was a, it was a matter of days before it suddenly shocked me to realize that he had dropped me a line and that the blacking out of these four words related directly to his memorial. Because the name that was blacked out, I can't give you every detail here, but here's the gist of it. There's a man named Joe Mo who organized the memorial. He was the closest man to Forrest J. Ackerman. He took care of all of his needs the last 10 years of his life. Um, and, uh, and Joe Mo, I called up Joe Mo uh, to find out uh, if he had some examples of Fari's editing. So I could see, did Fari completely black out words or did he just take a pencil and draw a line through it? Um, and before I could talk to Joe Mo, he said, wait, Paul, Paul, wait, before you tell me why you've called, I have to tell you. I said, I don't know whether to call it a hallucination or what. Or he said, I had an experience of Fari coming into my room and thanking me for the memorial. Um, and he said, this happened, it was like sort of a hypnagogic state. It was moments before I woke up in the morning, there was Fari. We had a conversation. He remembered the conversation. He told me exactly what was said. And it was a big thank you. And then he said, Fari's gone. Suddenly he's fully conscious. Fari's not there. And basically the message I got in those four words was spoke to Joe Mo. Spoke to Joe Mo. I call up Joe Mo. Fari thanked him. I was a speaker at the wedding. I'm somehow being told by something supernatural uh, that uh, spoke to Joe Mo. Thank Joe Mo. It's a way of saying, check with Joe, Paul. I thanked him. Thank you. It was like a thank you for the memorial, was what I concluded. But that was a conjecture. I took this document to the head of chemistry at Indiana University, Purdue, who began a study of the chemistry of it that involved other uh, chemists also, University of New Jersey, uh, uh, College of New Jersey, John, Dr. John Allison. They studied this physical evidence for a couple of years and they absolutely could not duplicate it. They could determine what the chemistry was and they said, it's just, they can't explain how it possibly could have happened. And the, the science of it, it's all in that DVD. It's in the book, The Atheist in Heaven. But look, that was the first thing that happened that convinced me that the spirit of Fari was in touch with me. However, the conclusion of this book has uh, an addendum listing about 140 incidents relating to Fari that happened to me, my wife, and others who knew him that all seemed paranormal, could not be explained, that all happened in the years 
after he died. This was published in 2016. The movie, he came out in 2013. So the movie covered about four years. And then this covered a couple more years of all these strange incidents that there were witnesses to. So why Fari? Why him? He was a futurist. A lot of his life, uh, science fiction was like looking at what was invented as stories as to how science could develop to create a future for us that we can't imagine now. As a futurist, if anybody would have wanted to reach back into our physical reality and send this message that life goes on, it would have been him. You know, and I, I, I claim it, it was him. And I've offered the evidence for it in a 500 page book written, uh, co-written actually with uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who has studied life after death. He's a professor at University of Arizona, Tucson. And he studied mediums, special university sponsored projects on the validity of mediums. He's a decade long project, project of attempting using sensors to communicate with spirit where the the computer programs, the sensors, the whole process is filmed on video. It's in in my in my movie, where you see apparent actual contact and response with spirit. So uh, take it for what you will, but I've devoted many years of my life. It's three movies. The third movie is called uh, The Life After Death Project Three: Seance Encounters. Why seance? Because the house that Fari lived in for most of his life, uh, we called it the Acker Mansion. He had to vacate it. He lost the house about six or seven or eight years before he died. He had to move to a smaller house. That house was purchased by someone I got to know, and they reported so much paranormal activity in the house. You can't, uh, you can't fathom it. You know the footsteps, the voices. Um, and the owner of the house then experienced it too. The sighting of uh, an older man reported by so many, the sighting of a woman who may have been Fari's uh, wife, um, the, the footsteps on the landing right outside the main bedroom where the new owner of the house uh, lived, uh, hearing the footsteps and then throwing open the door and there's nobody there. So we held a seance at the house and we invited mediums that had been vetted by Dr. Schwartz and we uh, invited scientists and we actually spent uh, let's see it was uh, four days and three nights at the house studying the phenomena in the house and on the last night we had the seance and some things happened in the seance that were captured live on camera you can see it in the, the movie that you can't you can't explain it. Uh, the thing that happened to one of the skeptical scientists that was there is just caught caught on film. So again, so I've been interested in the UFOs. I've been interested in the mystery of uh, life after death, the mystery of was Jesus in India, uh, the mystery of the miracle of uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin of Guadalupe, a Catholic miracle the Basilica to the Virgin in Mexico City. I filmed a movie called Before We Say Goodbye based on a stage play about that miracle. Uh, Timothy Leary in Psychedelics. You see, I've reached out for all of these different unusual uh, subjects and my independent films have been successful because the people interested in these subjects find them and seek them out. I don't have to I don't have, apart from interviews, I don't have to do a whole lot of publicity because people researching life after death, they're going to come across my films. Okay, now I have one last question because I'm sure uh, the people that are listening to you have questions. And I, and okay. They, and, and they, you raise your hand, you see the icon on the bottom, it says reactions, and you need to raise your hand if you have questions for Paul. But Paula's last question. <laughs> because this is my journey for research. Uh, my journey has led me to the fact that the, this is the evolution of human consciousness. Can you tell us anything at all about what you think about consciousness? 
I hesitate. You know, I I have a degree in psychology. Does that help me? No, not really. Um, you know, th there's so much speculation. Of course, scientifically, uh, the Schrodinger is it Schrodinger's cat? The 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 the, the basic experiment that had to do with quantum physics as to whether uh, whether light is a particle or a wave. This is one of the fundamental principles now in science that it gave birth to the whole field of quantum physics, I believe. Because in the experiment, the problem was that, uh, that light behaved, I'm, I'm trying, I don't remember which was which. I think it behaved as a particle until, no, it behaved as a wave until there was an observer with a consciousness observing the light experiment. And then it, 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 it changed and then it became uh, measurable as a particle. So science believes that human consciousness studying experiment actually had an effect on the experiment. There have been a lot of experiments of, uh, of, of, of this kind. There uh, have been experiments with prayer this way. Um, when you have thousands of people praying for one thing. Um, and uh, so there is a field of knowledge of that. And there is a body of evidence about it, but I'm no expert. There you go. Okay. No, that's fine. Uh, okay, Jillian, you have your hand raised. Would you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Paul. First, I wanted to say that I saw um, Roswell when it came out, and mm -hmm. I loved it. I was in middle school, <laughs> but I still remember watching it, so fan. Um, but I kind of want to piggyback on Paula's question a little bit. Did anything, when you were doing your research, filming or interviews for your life after death or spirit communication films, did anything ever tie back and inform your Roswell movie? You know, what informed me on the Roswell movie were all the people who were really directly involved that I got to speak to before they passed away. Um, so, uh, so that was where the, you know, the knowledge came from on that. Um, but the paranormal things that happened to me, you know, the, the about 140 things listed in Atheist in Heaven. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say where it comes from. Uh, you know, is it, is it actually the spirit of Fari or does, uh, you know, it's hard to answer. What I can say is, and this isn't the UFO aspect of it, but, uh, the evidence that came out that it was Fari, there was so much that was so specific to his personality, his life, his sense of humor, uh, the real name of his wife that a medium couldn't have known, but there it was, she had it. All of these things that suggested information is flowing from some unseen source. Now, has any information from any unseen um, extraterrestrial source informed me or come to me i can't i can't uh say that uh i know there's a whole field of channeling i'm not a channeler um you know and i'm and i'm enough of a skeptic that i'm always going to question if somebody tells me that there are people who have told me they're in touch um uh what you say uh, mentally mental telepathy they're in touch with uh an alien species that is providing them with all sorts of information. Even Gordon Cooper, in his wonderful book, Leap of Faith, you know, he was the great astronaut who uh, who confirmed for me also that Roswell had happened and was extraterrestrial. So even uh, Gordon Cooper was in touch with someone who had been a channeler who was receiving information, who received information telepathically about what the cause was that caused the channel Challenger shuttle to blow up. You know, they had all the pieces. They studied it for years. They have... She was told what it was. She informed them. They researched it and they said, by God, she's right. How would she know that? So some people are being informed of a lot of things, but I'm I'm not going to make any claims beyond what I've already said. You know, it's been strange enough. Yeah, they, uh, you know, it's the non-local 
principality that all points in space and time are one. And so that, you know, people don't die or people over vast different distances and vast times can interact. And I think that um, all of the information from um, remote viewing and from a number of different sources and from Dr. Greer's work kind of confirms that uh, consciousness is so important. And can I can I interrupt that and tell you of, because there are a couple of really strange things that have happened to me that haven't been published, but one relates to what you're saying. I have across from me in this uh, Bureau of Memorabilia, a photograph that was taken in 1940 of my parents when they got engaged. And I, I came across this photo after my mother passed away. I got the family photo album and I began scanning uh, all the photos. And I noticed that this one photo was something different about it than every other photo. It's the only one that was so strange like this. You see my mother's face here, my father's face here, they're seated and there's space in between them. And in between them, in that photo from 1940, you see the faces hanging in midair of two children that look exactly like me and my sister. It looks like me at age seven, my four year younger sister at age three. We have lots of photos of us at that age. The faces of the photo, she looked at it and she said, that's me, that's you. And, you know, it, intuitively, how is this possible? I was not conceived yet. I was conceived in 1946. I didn't exist. This picture was taken in 1940. And yet you can't explain why these two children, this is not special effects. No one ever tampered with this negative. It was an amateur photo taken with an amateur bellows camera of that day. And yet I have the photo and I've had it studied by three absolutely top photographic experts and they are all completely baffled. And, and I also wanna say that each one of them, when I told them the problem to begin with, each one of them was cocksure that they would solve this in, in an hour at most, just give them an hour with it and they'll tell me what it was. And here it is, in some cases, it's several years later, John Allison has written a paper about the whole thing, scientific paper uh, for health reasons. He hasn't been able to follow through on the final edit and getting it published yet, but uh, all three of these experts completely as baffled uh, as I am. So when you talk about non-locality and time, how do you define time? Do time times overlap with each other? This is something in my life I can't explain. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much for answering the question. That's a great story. Okay. Anybody else have their hand up? Anybody else? Have Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best, whatever's on your mind. Paula, Mary Ann. You guys have a question. I can't hear them. I know. You Are they muted? themselves uh yep yep yeah we already uh, interjected a couple up front yeah thank but, you yeah but do you have any other because he told you more about the life after death project i didn't know he'd go into the details of it so much i want to know if um you're talking about the soul phone by gary's dr gary schwartz if that's that the project the, yeah that's one of the things that he has tried to uh, engineer, he has devoted a lot of himself to it. He's tried to raise a lot of money. At the time that I was working with him, the soul <laughs> phone was an idea that he had. It really hadn't gone before that, beyond that. What he was doing at that time <laughs> was looking for yes and no responses from spirit uh, through sensors using a computer program he had created. I don't know if the cell phone ever came to exist or if. Well, it... I I think uh, Mark Pittstick and um, Dr. Gary Swartz are still working on it because I I know that I keep hearing them talking about it and emails are being sent out, so it, they're still active in the research. I don't know where it stands at this point. Right. How far they come? I think whether whether it works or not, Gary Schwartz really has made an enormous contribution to the field, and I think uh, even not even getting into his technical work with photons and 
and um, you know, and using computers to try to sensors to communicate with spirit, even setting all that aside, just his work with mediums alone, I, I think absolutely distinguishes him because he took it upon himself to um, vet lots of mediums um, to eliminate the ones that really had no ability, but thought they had ability, mm -hmm. and set them aside and identify certain ones that had an extraordinary ability that uh, cannot be explained. Now, uh, Dr. Gary Nolan, look him up. He is doing research in which he feels he has established that there's a certain part of the brain, and I can't name the part, that uh, ha that is different in people that have these mediumistic uh, abilities. And he has, he'll offer evidence and proof for that. Speaking of Gary Nolan, he's in another UFO movie that I executive produced. Um, and you can find it online. It, it came out last April. It's a film by Ron James. He produced and directed. My wife and I were exec producers. It's called uh, Accidental Truth, UFO Revelations. And I, I think it's one of the best uh, UFO documentaries out there. Ron is working on a sequel to it now. I think, um, I don't know how long it'll be before that's out, but uh, Ron is in charge of MUFON television, the Mutual UFO Network. And he, uh, so he's posting things, uh, videos, interviews for that all, all the time with many uh, ufologists in the field. And Sometimes he just needs to be encouraged, like by me, to say, have you done an interview with this one yet or that one? Or, And then he follows up. So, uh, But he has that as an open resource. Uh, thought I'd show you these covers of two of the six Star Wars sequel books that my wife and I wrote for Lucasfilm in the 1990s. These were being published at about the same time as I was working on uh, Roswell. We did six sequel books under contract uh, for Lucasfilm that that uh, continue the story after Return of the Jedi. They were very popular. They just they sold millions of copies in English, and then they were published in about six or seven other foreign languages. And this, this was a great great boost to me back then in the mid nineteen nineties. Everything was happening in my career. And then after that, you know, I've done another, I've done another 10 movies that are out there. You can find them at my website, links to them. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing an experiment now. I'm doing an AI movie, a movie where every visual image and every character has been created using uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, it's working. I don't know whether it's going to be released as one feature or whether there's so much material that it'll be a six-part uh, series with, of episodes. Um, but that's occupying a lot of my time right now. And, and I'm thrilled to experiment with what AI can, can do to help a low-budget independent filmmaker who can't summon five to $15 million to get his movie made and can use this as a way to actually make a movie that looks good. <laughs> so I, I had voice actors. Of course, they recorded everything. Um, and uh, that was done years ago. I recorded all these actors doing it. It was going to be a an audio book, but we never released uh, the, you know, the audio book. Oh, Paula, there's one other thing I must mention. And I promised Raymond Zemansky I would mention for this interview before we adjourn. I don't want to forget. There is a conference coming up in September, 20th, 21st, 22nd in Dayton, Ohio. Going to use the same conference center used by Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, and um, it's called the Hangar 18 Conference. And I'm one of the speakers. Uh, Peter Robbins, who's well-known in the field, will be one of the speakers. Yvonne Smith will be one of the speakers. Dr. Lynn Kitai, uh, I, I, can't, I can't name them all, but I think it's going to be an exceptional conference because it's organized by Raymond Zemansky, who has his whole career has worked 
as uh, an, an engineer at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he's been telling people for years, yes, 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 they were aliens from Roswell. They were brought here. They were brought to Wright-Patterson. It's a fact. And he's an employee there and he's been sounding the word. He wrote a, a book called, I think he called it, I think he called it 50 Shades of Grays, as in alien grays. Um, and uh, it hasn't caused a problem for him uh, working at Wright-Patterson, the fact that he's been saying, you know what, it happened. So I don't know if any of you will be able to join us, but we're gonna be in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, uh, and the uh, all of the information about the Hangar 18 conference will start to appear online within the next couple of weeks. So there you go. Okay, perfect. Anybody else? Anybody else? I want to just uh, add a comment, uh, Paul, to thank you for the big impact you have had on our world and on releasing information. And thank Paula too for bringing you to us tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me. It's it's uh, it's been a wonderful ride, and I'm I'm really grateful that I've been able to do it. Now, a lot of it was through the help of Universal Pictures, uh, NBC Universal International Television. My wife, uh, having been an executive at Universal, I would make these independent films that she would produce with me, and they released four of them to international television. Uh, and uh, and they put the uh, Life After Death Project in the Sci-Fi Channel. Let's see, they released Jesus in India and uh, Starry Night. Um, and uh, my, 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 oh, Before We Say Goodbye, the one about the Virgin of Guadalupe, they released that mainly in Latin America. And then, of course, Life After Death Project on Sci-Fi. Um, and that that helped so much financially that it made it possible for me to keep going through the years because it's been since um, since about 1999 I've been making uh, these independent films. So it's 25 years and it's about uh, 12 films plus a children's television series called The Grand Kingdom of Cookie Land. You can find that through the website too. Um, it's been very gratifying to get uh, the opportunity to fulfill these dreams. So thank you for your appreciation. Okay, thanks so much, Paul. I really, really appreciate the conversation. I would like to say something. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Hi. Uh, like, uh, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I'm really honored to be with you and because I can hear uh, a person that has the experience that you have. Uh, I am in Montreal, and I know that Gary Schwartz worked with uh, one of my friends, who is Mario Beauregard. And Dr. Beauregard is an authority on uh, the studies on consciousness around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they did uh, the documentary Expanding Reality. And they are talking about new paradigm in science. So they are pushing really a lot. I don't know if you know, they signed they signed with 400 other scientists something regarding uh, a new paradigm a non material uh, material um, it's called a non material paradigm in science mm -hmm. because it used to be like in science if you have something physical to analyze under a microscope that that does exist but consciousness doesn't exist. But the proof that there's life after death, like you did. So I think that their work uh, are really nice. And in their movie, in their uh, documentary, even the music will help people to open up their consciousness. The eye image, they work on this side. And Mario Boraga knows that it comes from the stars, from another planet is at that level. And he, he, he was fired of Uni University of Montreal. So this is why he is at the, the University of Arizona now. Oh. And he's, and he's working with Gar Gary uh, Swartwatch. That's fast. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I, I, did, I would just tell you briefly that Montreal figured, and, and Quebec figured very much into uh, of my experiences when I was in high school, because I spent two summers mm -hmm. uh, 
in uh, visiting Montreal and Quebec, traveling around, camping. I was a, uh, I've been a member of the Academy of Magical Arts in Hollywood for I don't, 35 years or so. I've always been into sleight of hand magic and I performed sleight of hand magic on the streets of Quebec for kids in French. My French was good enough that, and I, I have photos of like 20 kids swarming around mm -hmm. me on their bicycles while I was doing uh, uh, card tricks and things like that for them in Quebec. And very, very fond memories of those days in the Chateau Frontenac. And We have uh, a very nice province and country, but I can say that uh, we are more and more under a very totalitarian uh, government. So we are not in the freedom like you are in most part of the USA, it's what I can say. I'll, but we, we are in the battle to keep you. our freedom. <laughs> uh, but Mario Boraga also went at the UN in order to present this new paradigm in science. He went to that far. And I would like to ask you a, a question regarding what do you think, how you can explain that there's all these cover up and also Hollywood is coming out with so many film presenting uh, UFO phenomenon, element of disclosure. How come there's this, this opposition somewhere? Well, the opposition has always existed. And I think that um, David Grush, he explained it very well that, um, you know, the, uh, the Manhattan Project, the creation of the atomic bomb, the secrecy that surrounded that, there were certain protocols for what would be kept secret. And there were some aspects of the phenomena of, uh, of the UAP, the UFO, that David Grush said that the officials interpreted it as coming under the regulations of the secrecy, the same uh, secrecy that commanded the Manhattan Project. And that's one of the reasons why it's never become unraveled, that once it got locked up into that box, there's been no one to take it out of the box without it being a whistleblower, without it being a congressman who's, uh, who's interrogating somebody who has information to get it out of them. But officially, the farthest they've gone is to admit that there are craft that they have flight characteristics they can't explain. And that's a major concession. That is really, that's a, a big step in that direction. But still, they've drawn their line in the sand as to how far they're going to go. Now, as for Hollywood, of course, you know, the science fiction, it, it erupted in the early 1950s. A few years after the Roswell incident, we had the day the earth stood still. We had a really important film called The Thing from Another World by great director Howard Hawks which was about the crash of a flying saucer, not in the desert, not in Roswell, but in uh, the Arctic. They moved the Roswell story to the Arctic and they told it in that movie, it was 1951 or 1952. And you had George Pal who did the War of the Worlds back then, I think 1953. And then there was a flood of science fiction, great movies like Forbidden Planet and a lot of B movies. And then, of course, the thing that Hollywood has learned, certainly since Star Wars, is that these uh, fictional movies, they make money. Uh, audiences want to see them. They become some of the biggest series on television and really, really huge films uh, that are raking in literally billions of dollars for Hollywood. So it's one of the favorite uh, themes now. Although if you track this all the way up into the late 60s, it was still resistance to Hollywood to uh, moving these projects forward. It was still considered eh, B-movie level, not really serious. But you had Fire in the Sky about Travis Walton's abduction, which um, followed many of the facts of that case. And you had our movie Roswell, which did get made by executives at Showtime who believed that the story was true. That's the reason they put it forward. They had killed it at HBO where they were all skeptics or just felt they shouldn't bring it forward. And then over at Showtime, we had cooperation. So with Hollywood and entertainment, uh, it's a financial uh, 
reality of it is really uh, determining you know what's happening i'm going to add that a close encounter started my whole entire career so that's so important so important close encounters yep close yep I worked with Heineck for six years. I worked with Valet for the last five, uh, and they were both represented with Close Encounters. So Hollywood has had a very powerful, powerful, powerful role. In pa it. Paula, a movie that none of you may know about because we just saw it at the uh, Sedona Film Festival. Very entertaining. I don't know why. I don't think it's been distributed yet, uh, but it's called My Parents Were Abducted by aliens and I feel left out. And crazy title, good story, good script, really makes you think, very entertaining, terrific music. I hope that movie will find a distributor and get out there. I, I can't imagine that it it won't, but but remember that uh, my parents were abducted by aliens. That's that. Okay. So I just, just last week. One more question, and then I have to I have to uh, close it because it's getting to be an hour and a half here. One more question. Anybody else have one last question? Well, Paula, they don't, and I thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I also thank you very much for your interest in my new book, Growing Up Sci-Fi in Garrett Park, and I yeah. I hope through you a lot more people will learn about it. All right, Paul. Thanks for your time i really really enjoyed gabbing with you because we're really good friends and uh wish you a lot of luck and i hope to see you in person soon we hope it'll be soon all right absolutely thank you okay